This is a Raspberry Pi, which is basically a really small computer. And this is that same Raspberry Pi with a whole lot of accessories. After seeing a couple of these projects like the Cyberdoor 2064 and the Ogre project, I decided I wanted to make one too in my own style. These devices are called Cyberdex, and they're basically custom-built portable computers, and each one of them is usually built for a specific purpose. That might be using them for like a field computer or for mesh-tastic radio communication. But some of the key things that usually are a trend among these devices is they're usually portable, they're usually pretty small form factor, and a lot of times they have some pretty cool sci-fi or futuristic themes to them. So some of the key features that I wanted to include in mine were I wanted it to be fully 3D printable, I wanted it to be easy to assemble, have good usability, and I also wanted to include kind of a retro futuristic theme. So the first step in any engineering project like this is to get started on the 3D modeling. And that includes kind of laying out all the parts, seeing how they're gonna to fit together, and then designing all the 3D printed pieces that are gonna make up this entire assembly. This step alone took weeks of fine tuning and reiterating just to get to a point where everything not only looked good, but was also functional. One of the first challenges was to get the snap fit parts to fit together the way that I wanted. I designed everything with tolerances in mind, but the only way to really know how well it would actually work was to print out a bunch of test parts. These parts needed to be able to press together by hand while having enough holding strength to stay together. This is easier said than done because it needed to be strong enough to stay together, but loose enough to take apart by hand without damaging the pieces, which basically came down to tweaking submillimeter dimensions until it worked. Once I got those parts to fit the way that I wanted, there were a whole lot more 3D printed parts that all had to get printed before I could assemble everything together. So since I was gonna take hours and hours, I figured I would get started on the electronics. To be able to connect the Raspberry Pi to a bunch of other stuff, I was gonna need some custom circuit boards, which also meant that I needed a design software. It seemed like KiCad was the most common one out there that most makers in the community use, so I figured that would be the best one to learn. So there's three custom circuit boards in this design, and I figured I should probably explain what they're for. So what separates a Raspberry Pi from other computers is that they have programmable pins called GPIO. What these GPIO pins allow you to do is interact with other electronics, whether that be inputs like buttons and sensors or outputs for controlling motors and displays and all kinds of things like that. To connect all these boards to the GPIO, I use the 40 pin FPC ribbon cable that you can see marked in orange. So it starts at the board that's connected to the Raspberry Pi, going to the center board, which acts as power distribution and has all these different buttons that will connect to the GPIO. And then it shares it to this external board, which is connected to the outside. So you'll be able to hook up anything you want to the GPIO. I also have a dedicated route for I2C, which is a common communication protocol that's used for all kinds of different sensors. The next step is actually making these PCBs, which I obviously don't have the capability to do, which is why I have to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this project. PCBWay is a custom PCB manufacturer and they also help with design services if you need it. To make it really easy for anybody in the maker community to have their own custom PCBs made. All you have to do is upload your Gerber files from KiCad, and then they'll very quickly get started making them, and then when it's done, they'll ship right to you. But their services go beyond PCB manufacture. They also include things like custom CNC machining and even 3D printing. Once I got my PCBs back from PCBWay, the next step was a whole lot of soldering. As you can see here with how small these solder pads are, some of the soldering was actually pretty difficult. The only way that I could check to make sure that I didn't have any shorts or bridges between the contacts was to use these GPIO extender boards with the FPC ribbon cables. The solder pads on the part that's supposed to be for headers actually allowed me to check between each contact to make sure that nothing was connected that shouldn't be. After assembly, these are all the parts that make up the internal electronics. After soldering all the electronics, I could finally start putting some of these pieces together and see it take shape, starting with the upper portion, which includes the screens.
I added some synthetic grease to these bearing channels to help with noise and reduce wear on the parts. Next up was assembling all the base parts, which is what all the electronic parts are going to go into.
after all of that, it was finally at a point where I could test it and actually turn it on. So, theoretically, once I hit the switch, everything should turn on. Hmm. Nothing turned on. Obviously, that was a little disappointing. After all that work, you expect it to at least do something, and instead, it did absolutely nothing at all. So all you can do is get out the multimeter and try and figure out what went wrong. Okay, so I found a problem. So what I did to try to figure this out was trace the five volts that's supposed to be turning on this MOSFET. And we're supposed to be getting five volts here, but we get almost nothing. And so if I trace it along its path, we're supposed to go across this resistor to this pin, but across this resistor, it drops almost the entire five volts. And that is because this one, which is supposed to be 10 ohms, and this one, which is supposed to be 10K, are accidentally flipped. So when I was soldering this, I guess I wasn't paying close enough attention and I got the two mixed up. So it should be relatively easy to just desolder and switch these, and then we should be back on track. Okay, let's see what happens this time. One screen, two screen. Hmm. So the issue that was causing me to not be able to pass the boot sequence and power on was because there was actually a short on this little quick connector. So once I figured that out, I replaced it and now we should be able to power on. So after a couple of setbacks, everything was finally working and I could finish putting this thing together. So with everything fully built and working, let me show you a little bit about what this thing is and what it can do. It's got rotating hinges that allow it to fold down to a more compact size. Inside these hinges is an internal pin that keeps it from over-rotating. Both of these screens can rotate between portrait and landscape mode. These also have a mechanism that limits rotation to protect the cables from being pulled on. This can be really useful because I can have one screen in portrait mode to write code on while having the other screen as a reference for like a Raspberry Pi pinout. In this case, I'm writing a GUI, which you'll see later on. Or you could just use it to watch cool YouTube videos about cyberpunk while you work on your program. It's got a bunch of inputs like this linear slider that you could use to control volume or screen brightness, and four programmable buttons that you could use to program lots of other things. It's also got this rotary encode slider with a push button. On that same side, there's an auxiliary USB port that you can use to connect all sorts of different things like this Wi-Fi extender. In the back, there's a quick connector so that you can attach things like Adafruit I2C sensors. There's also an external GPIO header so that you can connect any standard Raspberry Pi shield that you want to this device. Another thing that I wanted to be able to do was very easily remove the Raspberry Pi from inside this device. 
And the idea behind that was that you could program it with having the keyboard and a mouse and all the different sensors and stuff to program and test whatever you want to do. And you can program that within the device and then be able to easily remove it so that you can put it in whatever it's intended for. So it has these quick eject handles that allow you to pull the display and USB cables out of the Raspberry Pi. And then all you have to do is remove it from inside the case. Admittedly, I could have made that a little bit better. Dimensions inside the case are, are really tight, so it could be easier to get it out of the enclosure. But once you get it out, all you have to do is take the GPIO header off, and then the Raspberry Pi is completely free to do whatever you want. And if you don't want to take the entire Raspberry Pi out, you can access the SD card so you can transfer images between Raspberry Pis. It's got the tactile feel of a mechanical keyboard with a whole bunch of interactive LED modes to make typing more fun. I put together a quick graphical user interface to show the readout of all the different inputs, including the rotary knob, the four push buttons, and the linear slider. There's also some readouts for sensors, which I'll be showing you shortly. So with everything done and complete, I figured I'd put together a little demo to kind of show what you can do with this. Uh, it's use of sensors and the screens and just to kind of demonstrate what you can do with a cyber deck like this. I wanted to use a combination of different I2C sensors to show the capability of chaining a bunch of sensors together to measure something. So for this little demo experiment, I decided to use a lux or light sensor on the bottom of this glass beaker, a temperature sensor to measure the internal temperature, and then a pH to measure the pH value of whatever liquid is in the beaker. So I started by adding some just room temperature water. And as you can see, the light sensor doesn't really change much because of the clearness of the liquid. And as I put in the temperature sensor, you'll see it starts to regulate at about room temperature. As for the pH, the pH level reads about 7. So to see the contrast of a liquid that would change all these values, I decided to use some hot coffee. The coffee immediately increases the water temperature and reduces the light intensity because it can't see through that murky liquid. And then as I measure with the pH, the pH level drops significantly because coffee naturally is more acidic than water. This is just one kind of experiment or a different development type project that you could do with a Raspberry Pi deck like this where you have a whole bunch of different inputs that you can use. Like most of the things I do, this was a completely new experience for me and there were a lot of things that I had to learn along the way. But I think I ended up with something that's pretty unique and useful too. And if you thought it was cool and you want to build one yourself, I've included all the documentation and part files on GitHub. You can find a link to that in the description below. And if you want to see more sci-fi projects like this, make sure to stick around for the next one.